I'm at Daytona Kart in Tamworth today, which is one of three circuits owned by Daytona. Um, one in Sandown, one in Milton Keynes, and this one in Tamworth. Here they've got two two levels of carts, one of which being your standard arrive and drive cart called the Sodi. This is something that you'll probably have driven before if you've had a uh, cart in day with mates or work. So the Sodis are your standard cart. Above that, however, they do have the D-Max carts, which are a lot more powerful much better lap times and generally a lot more exciting but only really for um, folks who are totally comfortable in the Sodis beforehand. So after these guys have finished the Sodi race here, we're going to be taken to the track in the D-Max in an open race in those cars. At the start of every session you're given your cart number by the marshals, they'll allocate your name to a cart. So that will show up in all the grid boards indoors in reception on the monitors. In the D-Max you have to start them yourselves. And that is when your car is now idle. So now we're just waiting for instruction from the guys to release it onto the track and go into qualifying for 10 minutes. So as you'll notice, the paddock for the D-Maxes, the little pit place where they keep them all is different from where they keep the sodas, but you still go out the pits in the same way. And at this stage, the carts have all been started from cold, they're smoky as hell. They are two-stroke engines at the end of the day, and you know what goes into them, just a mixture of petrol and oil. Um, yeah, you will get a lung full of, of uh, two-stroke smoke if you follow anybody closely behind like I am here. As it's the first time we're out on track, the tyres are cold, the brakes are pretty snappy, so you need to be pretty careful in conditions like this, um, where it's greasy. You don't really know where you're going to get grip and where it's going to slide. And on a day like this, having been there a few times when the conditions are similar it's never exactly the same um, as a rule of thumb though when it is wet or greasy the, um, the racing line is not where you want to be because that is where it's going to be greasiest or smoothest rather so the tarmac's going to be smoothed off um, the little granules in the <laughs> little granules in the tarmac are going to be uh, not quite as bitey as those that are off the racing line so at this point I'm trying to see where the grip is it's nowhere. It's so slidey and slow, at least at this stage with the tyres being cold. It's not like it improves that much when they are hot, but it is definitely a case of if you tried to gun it at this stage, you would be spinning round or just not able to turn. So it'd be pretty miserable. So getting the tyres hot and finding the grip is pretty much the name of the game for the first couple of laps. When the conditions are like this, um, the carts are on average maybe 25 to 30 percent slower than they would be in a dry, and it's mainly, well, it's all in the corners. It's just a completely different animal altogether, and it is frustrating when the carts are two stroke, they've got a power band right at the top of the engine, so it's satisfying when you do finally unlock that power. It actually feels like a really, really quick cart, but at the lower down revs, you may as well be in a SOD like on this corner here it's just so slow and agonizing this is a lot quicker in a dry as you'd expect but because the power band is so um, aligned towards the top of the engine it's there's a definite knack to it and i'm just still finding that knack i haven't got it quite yet as you'll tell It's at this stage that I'm noticing that there's something not quite right with a cart that I've been given. Um, it seems to be misfiring, 
when it's on full load at high revs it seems to be quite bubbly definitely not how I would normally expect it to be in these carts they are super smooth and super powerful and this one was running a bit bubbly so um, I've signaled to the marshal but you, there's only so much you can really communicate in a, in a hand so um, I'm just going to make my way into the pit on this lap and explain to the marshal there what the problem is and he'll, he'll switch me around to another cart which hopefully will be better off so I'm going to make my way into the pits now, I'm going to filter to the left and take it slow um, I'm going to drive past the sodas or drive into the middle of them where the marshal is and explain to him what's going on Yeah, it's hesitating when it's at top speed, so it's like, you know, like misfiring. Yeah. When you're like right over the rev range, it's misfiring. Alright, yeah, we'll drive yeah, up there and we'll swap it, okay? So yeah, just drive, drive up there. Damage. Drive up there, mate. Just, oh, yeah, right. just drive up there. Yeah, I didn't really know what he said there when he said uh, drive up, so I started getting out of the car like I was going to leave it with him. You know, like, it's his problem now. But, I'll take it up there, that's probably going to get looked at, and they'll just chuck me in another car that was working right and I'll be on my way. Cheers, I think the thing that sets these guys apart from your average car place is the organisation because it is good. I mean, something that I didn't even think about until afterwards was, was that they assign the carts ahead of time so that they know who you are in each car and it comes up on the telemetry on the boards, on the timing boards, in the reception. Now I've jumped out of cart 108 and into 115 and I didn't even think about it because at that point I'm just not bothered with that sort of thing. But at the end, you know, they say cart 115, Daniel Lee, which is... And that's when I just thought, eh, yeah, yeah, that's organised. Anyway, into another cart. This one seems to be immediately better. It's not lumpy on the top of the rev range at all. Um, and now I've had a couple of laps to acclimatise to it. I need to do it all again, but in a cart with cold tyres. And you can tell, you can tell it's cold tyres, it's just skatey. The grease, grease, grease? The grease and grip are completely intertwined. Some parts are pretty dry, some parts are slippy. And at this point, there's another yellow flag. I thought I'd passed it with that guy there, but there's somebody here with seemingly broken down. I found out after the race, he'd broken down. And the, um, I don't know how he got back to the pits, but by the time, the, by the time I went around there again, it was sorted. Reliability is not usually a problem around here at all, but um, today it just struck for me and him. But we were both sorted quick enough, so no harm done. I'm finding corner one quite tricky in terms of you get past the apex and then the grip seems to tail off even more so you end up on the, uh, the tarmac sort of runoff strip and when the conditions are like this um, if you are sliding to the outside and there's a concrete runoff area just to the end of it, a bit like that um, you tend to slide and slide and slide until you hit that different surface, that much rougher tarmac and then your cart grips so it's not as if you're going to go off into the hills if you get it a little bit wrong but it doesn't feel very elegant at all when you just slide around and and uh, your tyres are just grabbing onto the tarmac after you've uh, made a hash of it but nonetheless it does still save you in a pinch these hairpins are particularly tricky at this point it seems as if the closer you are to the inside the less grip you have and that is that correlates with what, what they say about the wet line in karting. The racing line is not where you want to be, but it's so hard to not use it when you feel like going around the outside is so much slower. But the proof is probably um, in the overall lap times. It just It's just hard. So that's just something I'm working on. So at this stage we get snuck up on by this guy um, because it's practice and qualifying you don't want to tussle unnecessarily with other people it's just going to slow you both down 
and it's not going to come out of anything productive. If you let them buy um, and you take a look at what lines they're taking, how they're taking the track, if they're quicker than you, you'll know where you're losing time and you can adjust your own line. Whereas if you start catching up with them, you know where you're quick and they're quick and you can use that to ascertain where you need to be defensive and where you can relax a bit. In either case, practice and qualifying is not racing so you're better off just sitting and watching them closely, see what they're doing differently to you and see if there's anything you can learn. So after the 10 minutes of practice and qualifying are over, the yellow flags come out, a full course yellow, and then you are down to half speed, just cruising back towards where the grid is to be stacked up and then assigned your position on the grid. So what's happening here is that uh, everybody's being lined up in a pack formation. Um, that's so that they can pick you out in your grid order. The same as the lower powered Sodi races, same format there. Um, so if you were fastest in that 10 minute practice qualifying, you get picked out first and you're sent to the front of the holding pack just around the corner until a whole grid is formed in the right order in terms of fastest to slowest. Then there is a rolling start, so the grid is set off at a slow pace in formation around the last hairpin until you reach the start and finish straight. Then the green light goes and you're all let, let loose under green flag conditions um, in your grid formation. This is done as opposed to a standing start for a couple of reasons. One of which being that apparently the, so, um, the uh, D-Max rather, they're more prone to flooding. So if you were at a standstill and you suddenly jam the throttle to the floor like you would in a standing start, you're more likely to, to stall it. And that's a big problem if you're at a standstill at the front of a grid with a pack of 10, 15, 20 carts all coming up behind you without any knowledge of you being stood still. So for the purposes of that, the D-Max starts rolling. So in a rolling start, all that needs to happen here is that the guy in first, the guy in a white helmet, he controls the pace, 
he's uh, required to go half speed or slower just to give the grid a chance to settle and actually get going before they, they uh, cross the start finish line as second place my job is to just stay level with the leader so with the two guys at the front controlling the pace everyone else in the field just has to keep an eye on the car in front and match their speed closely until the green flag goes above the start finish straight and then the race can begin properly This is up. So what you're gonna do now is you roll and start. So be in this formation around the hairpin. Make sure there's no racing, no overtake. Green light on top of the gantry. Okay. You two, in case that is, go too quick, pull away, get back back. Make sure everyone's nice and tight. Okay. Alright, can visors down? So left the dog, turn it all the way on. Put your arms in the air. Okay. 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 So now we're signalled to move off the grid around the corner onto the rolling start. So I just got to keep level with the first place guy to the right of me. Well, levelish. This is probably good enough. So I just give it a squirt to get level with him again. I'm watching for the green lights on the gantry. And it's off. That's it now. The race has now started. And it gets a little bit muscly. Everybody's skirting off on the first corner. And I'm a big loser in that one because now I'm down from 2nd to 5th and at this stage I'm thinking this has got to be a quick fight back I need to take every opportunity that's coming up and not waste any time so there's 5th down for some reason I was more confident in the breaking zone than he was um, so now we're on, trying to catch 3rd and 2nd I've got no idea at this point just how much further behind me they were on the qualifying lap they could have just been hundreds of a second behind me on their best lap so I've got to really get going on this if they are about the same speed as me and I just can't get past them if I spend the next 20 minutes trying to find a way past but I've given away second just on the basis of the first corner which ended up with me getting muscled off into the mud a little bit so here we go head down on the case next corner coming up after this sweeping right is one of the real overtaking hotspots for one reason the normal racing line is to stick out on the left hand side like these guys are but if you take advantage of a huge swathe of room in the inside if you put yourself on the inside line they have to give the corner away from you and the only thing that they can do about it is cut back on you and overtake you again but that will only happen if they can see you coming and so far I've gotten away with it so now we're focusing on taking second it seems as though second place may be slower in some areas and with me sticking my nose in like this it's bound to put him off it's no good when you're having pressure put on you all the time and he's about to go completely flying off and that's my chance so long as I don't now mess up myself, I'm in the clear. I just need to get some space between me and second and, and sorry, me and third and fourth now, 
and I should be good. And then it's a case of finding out if I can catch first. I mean, he's just gone. He's nowhere to be seen. So it all depends on whether I can find any pace, where I can find a dry line before he does and make up the time that way, or if he makes a mistake. You just don't know. So for the time being, it's now full throttle, trying to go as fast as I can to catch first, even though he is miles down the road relative to me. So we'll soon be coming up against our first lapped cart, our first bat marker. The only thing to remember really is to treat them with some respect. They are slower than you if you come up against a lap cart. Because they are slower than you, there are opportunities to pass safely without muscling them out of the way. It just makes them feel bad and I don't want to ruin anyone else's, you know, um, ruin anyone else's session. We're just trying to have a decent time and there's no point in, in um, taking them out just to save a few seconds which it usually doesn't anyway good conduct is important and there's no money on the line so just get past safely and carry on without stepping on anybody's toes
about to come across two carts, which I don't think are racing each other yet. This could be a case of me coming up against a bat marker who's coming up against another bat marker that's getting double lapped. Um, in any case, it's a problem if you're on the leading lap because these two guys are not going to be thinking about you, they're going to be thinking about how they're going to get in front of each other. So always got to be careful that one of them is not going to swing out suddenly and take you out in the course of it. So got to be cautious but also got to find a way past and you're about to see an absolute hero move right here. That's nice of him. He does the job for me. I get by and I just laugh at what I've just seen.
so here's what happens when you come across um, a couple of lap carts which aren't actually that far off your own pace. Remember, it's, they are short circuits, cart circuits, so you can come across somebody that you're lapping and yet still find it quite hard to get past, which is the case here. Um, they're not necessarily instructed to let you by, you've got to find your own way. So I'm thinking, how am I going to get past these guys? Do I really want to disrupt their own race as well? Because if they're having a good race and I come along and screw that up, that's also a bit rubbish as well. You know, I'm concluded at this point, but nothing short of a mistake from first place is going to give me that place. So I just try and get by, but I think their race might be compromised. So we're coming up against a, la uh, a lapped cart that I recognised from before. This guy was last in the in the grid, so I know that I'm gonna find it easy enough to overtake him once we're in the corner bits. But at this stage, we're in the straight. There's no overtaking opportunity here, really. So you just gotta line up the next corner and take that chance instead. This is a case where patience and doing it on turn three or turn four instead of trying to get past on that um, slightly dog-legged straight. It's just a safer option, and I haven't really lost any time. Now checkered flag is out and I haven't seen first place jammed cart first into a tyre wall so second place is mine. It's been quite a tough race because it, it, the track is greasy. It's been less about racing the competition and more about racing the track. I do enjoy it a lot more in the dry for sure but it's winter in the UK so this is just the reality and everyone else is struggling the same. The track is no worse for me than it is for first place so he's won it on merit I can't really complain about that I just need to get better at uh, finding that grip in the greasy wet conditions and then we'll uh, we'll start seeing some closer fights so on I guess a parade lap you just take it easy have a chill just a bit of a cool down after 20 minutes of solid effort quite relaxing in a way but then we'll make it into the pits at the end of this lap and then we'll park up, get out, and we'll be able to check out our printouts of the time recordings, lap positions, fastest laps, etc. And if you're on the podium, you'll get a little trophy, which is quite nice. But that's about it.
So there's a whole bunch of guys sitting on the right hand side here now in the Saudi carts. I presume they're going out for their own um, booked session, probably a party or something like that, or an open race. So we go into the D-Max paddock, swing around in a in a circle, and park up. If you've been in a Sodi Karts a few times before at Tamworth or even Sandown, Milton Keynes, whichever one, um, and you're wondering about the D-Maxes, whether they're worth the upgrade, because they are usually nearly twice as expensive as the Sodis for the same amount of time, is it worth it? Well, definitely the answer to that is yes. Um, at the very least, the first time you go in them, it will knock your socks off, particularly if it's a dry day. If it's a wet day, it will still be a worthwhile upgrade. Um, for some reason, the D-Maxes have a lot more grip and uh, general pliability in the, in the wet. The sodas seem like they're all over the place. D-Maxes less so. It's just a shame that on a wet day, you can't really get the full potential out of them because they are genuinely quick. And that's all from me today. Thank you very much.